Good evening, Facebook Live and YouTube Live. My name is Scott Murray, and I am the superintendent in Ector County Independent School District, and I welcome each of you this evening for this very special conversation. Uh, we It promises to be rich uh, tonight, filled with lots of dialogue and, and certainly lots of questions I assume that we're going to receive tonight. And so in, in anticipation of a lot of questions, I've got some very special guests uh, that are going to join us this evening. So let me take just a moment to introduce uh, two ladies that are going to be uh, part of this evening's conversation. Our Deputy Superintendent, uh, Dr. Stephanie Howard, is joining us tonight. So welcome, Stephanie. Thank you. You're welcome. Nice to have you. And, and you have a nice view out of your office tonight. The, the weather is nice uh, this evening in the city of Odessa. And also joining us this evening, yes, it is. Also joining us this evening, Dr. Lilia Nanez. And Lilia is responsible for um, our curriculum and instruction program in ECISD. So, Dr. Nanez, thank you for joining us. It is my pleasure to be here, sir. All righty. So, we are armed and ready to respond to lots of questions tonight. Um, and as uh, we get into those questions, our topic tonight is, is very simple and yet complex. The simple part of it is we are going to talk about the opening of schools in Ector County Independent School District and uh, the process that we've used to create our models and then exactly what that's going to look like this year from transportation to food service to uh, classroom instruction. Um, as well as remote learning. We'll walk through all of that tonight. And at the end of our presentation, an opportunity for um, each of you as parents uh, to ask uh, questions tonight. We'll respond to as many of those questions as we can. But I will emphasize tonight will not be the only opportunity that our parents will have a chance to ask questions. We will uh, continue to provide opportunities over the next coming days and weeks um, for you as a parent to ask any questions that you wish. And, and, and we want you to feel confident in the work that we're doing uh, to educate your children. We want to make sure that you feel comfortable um, when you send your kids uh, back to us or comfortable in the choice that you make uh, this year uh, to educate your children in 2021. All righty. Our conversation tonight is going to focus on moms and dads. We know that we may have lots of staff members uh, in ECISD and others in our community that are joining us this evening. And you are all welcome. But we really want to focus our questions and answers tonight uh, to our parents, our moms and dads and guardians, aunts, uncles, those of you that will have children attending schools or attending school with us next year. So with that, we're going to jump into our presentation. We delivered this last night to our board of trustees. Some of you may have been watching that presentation. Um, and for others, this may be the first time you're seeing it. And so we're going to uh, jump into that right now. Let me share this screen. All right. That pre there you go. That presentation is up. So again, introducing the uh, opening of schools 2021 and our plans uh, for the coming school year. We focused um, in, to develop these plans, um, first of all, our goal that we have for students at ECISD. Uh, our students, the future, we recognize the kids we serve today in our schools are the future of not only the city of Odessa and Ector County, but the future of our state, nation, and world as well. And we've got to prepare them to be successful in that future. We also uh, pay close attention to our, our mission, making sure that we prepare our kids. I think the last sentence or the last line is very uh, important, the adaptable and an ever-changing society. And I think we have learned over the last several months um, how important it is that all of us um, are adaptable to a society that is clearly ever-changing. It is, in fact, in our world, it seems to change by the day um, in this new environment. We used a set of guiding principles in order for us to make decisions for the students that we served. We wanted to make sure that we were principle driven um, in those decisions. And I share those with you uh, tonight. First one is equity, making sure that all of our children, no matter what their situ situation may happen to be, whether they are a child of poverty um, or a child that is uh, that has a specific uh, learning disability, whether it is a child that has some other type of situation that may not be on an equal playing field, we wanna make sure that this, the school experience is equitable for every type of child. And so equity was a primary driver in our decisions. We also wanted to be a, a district that is a, a district of leaders and not followers. We weren't gonna wait uh, until other people made decisions and copy decisions. We wanted to make sure that we were leading uh, the movement to appropriately educate kids uh, in this new era. We wanted to make sure that we take care of our most fragile children. We recognize that a large number of our children uh, during the spring did not have a healthy remote learning experience. And we wanna make sure that our work 
um, it, we are intentional about supporting uh, the most fragile children that we serve in our system. Uh, we, we do recognize that, that we need to meet kids where they are as our children return to school, and you'll see some data in a few minutes, but many of our school, our students may have lost ground, not only academically, but they may be suffering from some social and emotional issues due to the traumatic experiences uh, related to COVID-19. We need to be ready for all types of children that we receive on the first day of school. We want learning to be personalized for kids, again, and recognizing that our kids may be academically in different places. We need to make sure that we're ready to meet those individual needs of our kids. We believe in acceleration over remediation. Many times remediation keeps kids constantly behind. And we know that acceleration not only catches them up, but gets them ahead. And so we will pay much more attention to accelerating our kids uh, next year as we spend, um, instead of remediating our children we use multiple forms of assessment. When our kids come back, as they begin the year, it will be important that we fully understand who our kids are and where they happen to be academically, socially, and emotionally. And so we'll be using a variety of different assessments to help our teachers fully understand where our children are so that they can better meet uh, their, their learning needs. Um, we will be uh, good stewards of the work that we do. Uh, as we enter this new school year, we recognize that our economy may not be the same and we may suffer, suffer uh, financially, which could uh, lead to some issues with human resources and other areas. So we wanna make sure that we are effective and efficient in the work that we're doing as an organization. And, and finally, and, and probably most importantly, the partnership that we have with you as parents and with members of our community will probably be more important now than ever in the history of, of public education because our models will continue to uh, depend upon the, the full and complete engagement of parents and guardians, aunts, uncles, those involved in the lives of our children. So these guiding principles we used uh, to drive our decisions as an organization. We prepared three scenarios um, as, we began the, as we begin the school year because we're not sure even today what the ultimate scenario may happen to be. We, scenario number one is that every school is open and every child is able to come to school. We do not anticipate that to be the case. In fact, we're not sure that may occur at all this year, but we've got to plan for that scenario should it occur. The second scenario is all schools are closed. If the current health conditions in our community and in our state indicate that we must close all of our schools, uh, then we need to be pre prepared to provide remote learning for every child in ECISD. And so we have a plan for that. And finally, hybrid. Uh, so a little bit of closed uh, um, virtual learning and a little bit of face-to-face -face with teachers. We prepared for that environment as well. And so the work of our team involved ensuring that we have plans uh, to meet the needs of our school district in all three of those areas. You're looking at the teams. On the left side, you see uh, the title of the teams. We, uh, Dr. Stephanie Howard led a large task force of individuals, students, parents, teachers, staff members, administrators, community members. A lot of individuals made up the task forces or the task force that was put together. And they were subdivided into, the, into 18 uh, committees. And you can see the, the names of the committees on the left and then the individuals that led each of those committees uh, on the right. So what can you anticipate um, as we enter this new school year? First of all, academically, uh, this graph represents a body of work that was done by a national research and assessment uh, organization. And they looked at the growth of, of students, not just in ECISD, but actually the growth of 10 million students across the United States. And you can see from September through March that we had steady growth. And in this case of fourth graders and eighth graders, but in general, students were growing steadily until we closed school, until students no longer had access to their teachers, growth was occurring. But the moment that we entered that remote learning environment, you can see on the right side of this graph, that dotted line in the middle indicates that while we were uh, moving um, upward, progressing in the right direction, that line began to turn downward. And that simply means that the growth and development of our students began to decline rather than continue to increase. This graph says, that some of our kids may experience um, a year or more worth of learning loss in the area of mathematics. In fact, mathematics is the single most impacted subject area of all subjects uh, that we'll be dealing with next year. And you'll see how we're responding to that in a few minutes. Reading, 
you'll notice the trajectory while our students were engaged with effective teachers during the year. But once March happened, uh, we went into a remote learning environment. So learning changed for our kids. And you can see while reading is in a dramatic loss as mathematics, there is still significant room for concern. Again, our kids may have lost up to a full year worth of reading uh, knowledge and wisdom and expertise. And so we, we need to make sure that our kids have that ability uh, when they return to school. And so we're paying attention to the academic data that points to the fact that many of our kids may have experienced significant learning loss during the last several months. One in five ECISD students rarely or never has access to the internet. Tonight, all of you are accessing us via the internet but one in five students in our system does not have this opportunity in the family unit to access uh, remote learning. And, and this is important for us. So we'll be uh, addressing this a little bit later. You'll see what we're doing in order to meet the needs. But this was an important factor as we put our plans together. We also asked parents uh, some questions. Early in the month of July, we sent a survey to all of our families asking you a variety of questions. But one of the questions revolved around the plans that you have for your, your child. And you can see, uh, the survey question number six was in both English and Spanish. We had a, a well over 10,000 responses to the survey. So thank, thank you for taking time to fill that out. And what you've told us is approximately 65% of you uh, would like to send your children back to school in a face-to-face -face environment. And 35% of you would like your kids to remain at home in a virtual environment. And so our opportunity is to make sure that we uh, provide both for you. And you'll hear about what that looks like a little bit later. Um, and then we also talked with our staff, uh, about 1,849 staff members responded to a staff survey. Again, that would our cafeteria workers, bus drivers, teachers, administrators, et cetera. And not, you'll see almost 97% of our staff said that they are ready uh, to, to return to work and uh, provide for the needs of your kids. So I, I really lift up our staff to you tonight and, and thank them for their interest. You can see that they're hungry to return to the business of, of educating children. We appreciate that. All right, so what will that look like as we begin uh, the new school year? First of all, we received guidance from the Texas Education Agency, and the guidance came in two forms. There were things that we shall do. In other words, we do not have an option. We must do these things. And there were a whole lot of shoulds. Uh, these are things that we should do as an organization. And what you're looking at on the screen right now are some of those shalls. Um, so every school district in the state of Texas must be open for the 2021 school year. Uh, we could not tell you as parents that we're going to close down and we'll see you in the year 21-22. Uh, we are required uh, by uh, Texas order to provide an education for, our, for your children, and we will certainly do that. The second thing is, is we must provide a choice for you, and, and we'll talk about those choices in a few minutes, but every parent in ECISD must have a choice as to how you want your, your child educated this year. And uh, so we'll be providing those choices for you. We'll share those again in a minute. We also have an opportunity to provide for a transition period. Uh, the Texas Education Agency has given every school district an opportunity to use the first four weeks of school as a transition into your learning plan. We'll talk through that in a few minutes. In addition to that, if in our local community, um, our tests, our positivity tests, and again, those tests, uh, the, the percentage of people that are testing positive each day if that test, along with the rate of increase in the number of tests, if that rate is increasing and the positivity test remains high, uh, then we could ask our board of trustees to extend that four week period of time in which we transition into eight weeks. Um, we're, we will make that decision during the month of August when we look at the local medical situation in our own community. So right now we are planning for a four week transition, but please know that it could turn into an eight week transition pending uh, the medical situation in our own community. All right, cleaning, disinfecting, safety. Um, we wanna share a few of the things that we are doing um, in our schools this year to make sure that your children uh, and our employees are safe in our environment. The first thing that we will be doing, we will follow all of the guidance that is provided uh, by the Center for Disease Control, as well as the Texas Education Agency, and then our local um, um, health care providers, our own medical community right here in Ector County, will be providing, uh, will be following all of their guidance, and you'll see that on display in each of our buildings, as well as in each of our classrooms. We have purchased uh, the 
where we're really partnering with an organization called Germ Blast. They will be providing um, a sanitation opportunity in each of our schools. So three times during the, the coming year, uh, Germ Blast will come in and disinfect each of our campuses, uh, not only our schools, but the buildings in which our employees work. Uh, that the first treatment of that will actually happen uh, either the end of this week or next week. So every building will be treated by germ blast before the start of the school year. So you as parents can know that uh, we will have that treatment in place the day that your children return to school. Masks, we will uh, recommend that all kids from pre-K through third grade uh, wear masks during the school day. And again, that's a recommendation. Our healthcare community uh, says that uh, it, that children at that age, it may not be advisable. Uh, we sh that's something that we should not require. And so we're, again, leaning on the guidance of our medical community. So we are recommending that our kids from pre-K through third grade, parents, you may talk with your children about what you would like for them to do during the day. However, there are a couple of exceptions. Um, children in pre-K through third grade must wear a mask when they're riding a bus and they must wear a mask when they're transitioning. So if, when children are entering school, they must wear a mask and when they're traveling down the hallway, uh, they must wear a mask. But the other times when a child is in their classroom, um, we will not require that pre-K through third grade students wear it. It'll be an option for them. Our all fourth through 12th grade students will be required to wear a mask. Uh, that will not be an option for those students. They'll be required to wear it all day long. The exceptions would be when they're eating breakfast and lunch. And then if they're outside engaged in physical activity and they are maintaining social distancing uh, rules, then they do not have to wear a mask again when they're outside of our buildings in physical education or in some other activity, uh, perhaps an extracurricular activity. And as long as they're maintaining uh, social distancing rules, they, they do not have to wear a mask outside. Um, staff, the same thing. All staff members um, in ECISD at every level must wear a mask. Even the superintendent, the teacher, principals, cafeteria workers, custodians, all of us will be wearing masks uh, next year. The exception to that would be when we are eating uh, breakfast and lunch. And then if we are outside uh, with a group of students and we are social distancing from those kids, we are not required to wear a mask um, at that time. Some of our employees may even wear on top of their mask um, a face shield. We are requiring certain types of employees to also wear uh, face shields next year, such as bus drivers and other individuals that are uh, closely, uh, work closely with students will be required uh, to wear a, a face shield in addition to their mask. Um, every family, uh, as a parent, you'll be required to screen your children next year before you send them to school every single day. So you'll need to do a quick medical check, make sure your child is not demonstrating any COVID-19 symptoms, uh, make sure they haven't traveled out of the country to a contaminated area, and there'll be a list of guidelines. This information will be uh, found on the ECISD website, but every day, every parent will need to ensure that your child is healthy before you send them to school. That guidance will also tell you uh, what you need to do should your children display some type of condition or symptom rather that is related to COVID-19. So more information on the EC ECISD website about that process. And then we do anticipate next year um, as we as human beings return to our buildings, we can anticipate that we may experience uh, cases of COVID-19 either that are brought to campus by children or brought to campus by adults. And we have a pretty uh, rigid criteria that we will use in the event we need to close a classroom or close a hallway or close a, an entire building. Uh, we will have that outlined on the ECISD website as well. And so parents can, can look at that information. You may find this interesting. We've made a lot of purchases this summer. I can tell you as a superintendent, I, 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 I can assure you, I, I never thought I would say that that our, I lead a school district that has purchased 1,300,000 masks, but I can tell you that tonight, that we've purchased 1,300,000 masks, as well as thousands of gallons of hand sanitizer, uh, face shields, plexiglass, gloves, thermometers. We've purchased a lot of personal protective equipment, PPE, and you'll see that on display next year. When our children enter the building, they'll be required to use um, uh, hand sanitizer uh, throughout the day. Uh, our children and staff members will be using hand sanitizer. They'll be washing their hands. And so all of these PPE uh, tools will come in handy next year in our schools and in, in our various facilities. 
All right, the schedule. So what does a day look like for kids? We're gonna talk elementary first and then we'll move to middle school and high school and you'll see a lot of similarities as we travel throughout this. First of all, our elementary parents, you will have three options at the elementary level. Option number one is you can have your child in school five days a week and that is your choice as a parent. Option two is you may have your child at home five days a week uh, to, have, to experience remote learning. And then your third option is you may alternate days between remote learning and um, on-campus learning. And again, that choice will be yours as a parent. Uh, starting on uh, July 29th, our, you as a parent will have a, an opportunity to make those selections for your children. Children on campus will have limited movement that will take place on all of our campuses, elementary, middle school, and high school. Limited movement of students, much more adult movement than we will have children or child movement. Kids next to you will not be using lockers, cubbies, or other storage areas. The backpack will be the primary storage area for children next year at every level. And so as a parent, think about your child really being a self-contained unit. Their supplies will stay with them. Uh, their technology will stay with them. Their books will stay with them. Everything that a child uses will be contained in their book bag. There'll be no access to lockers or cubbies. Um, we will, an exciting announcement, we'll be providing devices for every child that needs one next year. So if, if your children do not have a computer or a, a tablet, we'll be providing those tools for kids next year. Some of you may already have those tools for your kids and you can uh, simply provide those tools if you want to or take advantage of those opportunities in ECISD. But, but in our system, 34,000 kids next year, every child will have an opportunity to receive a device from ECISD pre-K through uh, 12th grade. And they'll need to transition that device back and forth uh, to school and from school every day because we never know when we might have to close a campus or close a district because of COVID-19. And so that computer would become critically important in the learning process for our kids next year. And then the last one you see on here, lunches. We will be serving, uh, we announced this the other day, we're excited to announce that every child in ECISD will receive free breakfast and lunch. Um, no matter who you are, that is every single child, all 34,000 free breakfast and free lunch from ECISD next year. We will be delivering uh, meals to classrooms and to other locations. So the cafeteria experience will not occur next year for our kids as our cafeteria staff will be delivering meals um, throughout the campus, both breakfast and lunch. Um, kid, you, if you're, you may also as a parent uh, opt for uh, bringing your lunch. Children do not have to uh, uh, receive the service from ECISD. Children may also bring their lunch. But the one thing that, that parents uh, will not be able to do next year is to actually bring your child's lunch uh, to the school. Uh, kids will have to bring that themselves. Uh, so we will, we will not allow next year moms and dads to bring lunch during the lunch period to children. They'll either have to bring it with them when they come to school or they will have to eat uh, what is provided uh, by ECISD. Typical day for an elementary child, you can kind of see what this looks like. This would be a, a hybrid schedule for a child. So you as a parent, if you have chosen uh, to uh, have that hybrid experience, you can see uh, on Monday, for instance, a child would have a time with a face-to-face -face teacher, or math, reading, science, social studies, et cetera, throughout their day. On Tuesday, the child would experience all of those subject areas, except their experience would be in a remote environment. And you can see the words synchronous and asynchronous. We'll talk about what that means in just a few minutes. Um, the one piece I would point out on the schedule is the larger block for mathematics. If you'll remember, the data said in the beginning uh, that math is the primary academic area that has suffered the most learning loss. And we wanna make sure that all of our children um, are able to make up for any of that loss that might've occurred. And so we have extended the math learning times at the elementary level for students next year. And again, their schedules will reflect that. Moving on to middle school, you'll notice the same options for you as parents, um, completely virtual, uh, five days a week at school or the hybrid option. You can choose any of those three that you wish as a parent. Uh, the, the courses that kids take next year will be based upon the selections that they've already made that occurred this spring. Again, at the middle school, no lockers, no storage areas. All kids will have to be completely self-contained. They'll carry all of their tools with them in their backpack. Kids, again, will need to bring their device with them every single day to school as they will be using those devices both at school and at home. And then again, lunches provided by ECISD for all middle school kids. Uh, next year, breakfast and lunch. And again, a child can also bring their lunch if that's something that they wish to do next year.
And then a typical middle school schedule looks similar to what you saw in elementary. So a, a middle school child on Monday, uh, that would be face-to-face -face instruction with the teacher kind of moving through their school day. And then on Tuesday, it, in that hybrid model, that child would have a remote learning experience and the learning would be either synchronous or asynchronous with uh, that child's teacher. And I'll move it on to high school. Our high school students next year will have only two options. One option is to remain fully virtual. And so the child would spend uh, their day in a virtual synchronous environment. Again, we'll hit those words in just a minute. Or uh, the child, um, the high school students can experience a hybrid environment. So they would have one day at school and then another day at home. And they would alternate this A, B type of schedule. So Monday at school, Tuesday at home, Wednesday at school, et cetera. And each child will uh, find themselves in one of those alternating groups. So a day at school and a day away from school. Uh, schedules for high school kids are based upon their selections from last spring. Again, high school students, there'll be no lockers available for kids this year. They've got to be self-contained. All their tools will have to be in their backpack. Uh, again, high school kids will have to bring that device every day, take it home and bring it to school because, again, we never know when we we'll, might have to transition to a fully remote environment for everybody. And high school lunch period, I, I, I really hate this for our juniors and seniors. I know many um, of our high school kids, especially juniors and seniors, look forward to that off-campus lunch opportunity. At some point during the year, we hope to provide that for our students, but right now it is simply not a safe option for kids. And so the students in ECISD, all, ninth through 12th graders, will all eat campus on lunch. They have a choice. They can either eat free of charge, breakfast and lunch uh, provided by ECISD, or they may uh, bring their own lunch. Again, no deliveries will be allowed next year on campus and kids may not leave campus for lunch. But please hear me say parents and especially juniors and seniors, if during the year it becomes safe to do so, uh, we hope to resume that off-campus lunch opportunity for our students. So uh, we'll hope that, that our community can take care of itself and will become healthy and, and that privilege can come back to our kids. Alrighty, typical high school schedule. Uh, you can see uh, this looks like a, a, a freshman or sophomore schedule perhaps. Uh, so Monday, that A day, I have face-to-face -face instruction with my teachers. And then on Tuesday, uh, I have the same classes, but my instruction would occur, excuse me, at home uh, in a either a synchronous or asynchronous manner. So at school one day with face-to-face -face instruction and the very next day, I'm at home receiving instruction and then the following day I'm back at school and we'll rotate the, that A day, B day uh, throughout the school year for our high school students. I mentioned at the beginning that we're gonna phase in this process. And so this is what that phase in process looks like. So starting on August 12th, you can see that is the first day of school for 34,000 kids. Every single child in ECISD begins school on August 12th. Most of our students are gonna begin school virtually, but some of our kids will begin school face-to-face -face on August 12th. On the screen, on the right side, you can see who those children are. So students in ECISD that do not have internet access, those children may come to school on August 12th, very first day for face-to-face -face instruction. Students that receive special services from ECISD, those students may come to school on the very first day. Our three-year-olds, uh, those children that are the youngest kids that we serve, they may come to school on the first day. And then our employee children will come to school on the first day. The reason for employee children is our employees need to serve your children. And in order for our employees to do that, we need to make sure that their kids are also in, engaged in the learning process. Um, and they need to be, uh, some of those kids may stay home, they're at the high school level, but for those ECISD employees that need to serve your children, we need to make sure that their kids um, are taken care of so that they can be of service to our kids. So that is phase one, starts August 12th, and the kids on the right side of the screen, those are the kids that may come to school on the first day. Phase two begins on August 18th. And so in addition to the phase one kids, these are the phase two kids that on August 18th, they may begin to come to school. Pre-K through second grade students, a pre-K through first grade at Peace and Zavala Elementaries, third grade students at Noel and Travis, and then all of our sixth graders and all of our ninth graders, as well as, and uh, those third, sixth, and ninth graders will begin to follow that A day, B day schedule. So they will alternate the days that they come to school. Then on August 24th, we begin phase three. You can see on your screen, uh, all the kids that are involved in phase one and phase two will continue to come to school. But in addition, we're gonna add this week, third grade students, 
fourth graders at Cameron, Noel, and Travis, second graders at Peace and Zavala, all seventh graders, all 10th graders, and then you'll see that our third, fourth, seventh, and 10th graders will follow that A day B schedule. And finally, phase four for us uh, begins on Friday, August the 28th, and we will involve the, our fourth and fifth graders. That will be their first day of face-to-face -face instruction. Sixth graders at Cameron, all eighth graders, and then all juniors and seniors uh, will uh, come to school on that day again, following that A day, B day schedule. And so that is our phase in process. Right now, our phase in lasts for four weeks, as you can see. However, if the health situation in our community is as bad as it is today, then we may have to extend this phase in process up to four more weeks. And so you could anticipate uh, the possibility of change in the phasing process. I hate to share that with you, but I wanna prepare you for the continued changes that may occur due to the health situation in Ector County. And so we all just have to be prepared for that. But right now, we're hoping that on August 12th, uh, the, the statistics are much better than they are today and we'll be able to start our plans as we're laying them out tonight. Specifically learning, kind of what is it gonna look like? Uh, we commit to high quality, rigorous learning experiences, both face-to-face -face and in a virtual environment. The, the big difference between remote learning this year and last year is in a remote learning environment, uh, our teachers are directly involved in those experiences. And you'll, you'll learn more about that in a minute, but it'll be very different in that remote experience for our children this year, I can assure you of that. Um, all of our children have, again, access to a device, so we'll have that one-to-one -one environment um, a place for our kids. We use a concept called blended. Blended learning simply is the very best of a face-to-face -face teacher coupled with the very best in technology. So you'll begin to see uh, some blended learning experiences for your children next year, and you'll hear more about that. I mentioned this word a couple of times, synchronous learning. Synchronous is really what we're all experiencing right now. Uh, some of you may watch this later, they might watch the video, but for those of you that are live at this moment, this is synchronous learning. Uh, I, as the teacher, if you will, am sharing information with you. Um, and in a few minutes, we'll be receiving some information back from you through the form of your questions. And that is synchronous learning, face-to-face, real-time. It can occur on a computer. It can occur on a telephone. So there are a variety of ways that synchronous learning will occur next year for our students. The other side of that is learning that is happening, but a teacher isn't directly involved. It is learning that will happen anytime, anywhere, and it is self-paced. The, the picture that you see on the screen is a little girl is using a software application in the learning process, and that is an example of asynchronous learning. Uh, the teacher is not directly involved. There is no live experience in that situation. Teachers will check in daily with kids. Of course, that, that easily occurs during our face-to-face -face instruction, but during the virtual instruction and uh, in that remote learning experience, teachers will check in every single day uh, with your child. And that, that is something that must occur next year. So your kid will have contact with a, child, with a teacher every single day if they have that remote learning experience. Grading guidelines will be the exact same guidelines uh, for kids that are at school as they are in the remote learning environment. Those guidelines will be exactly the same. The teachers are using the same curriculum and the grading guidelines will be the same. And then attendance. In order for your child to earn credit for courses or in order for a child to be to successfully complete a grade level, they must be in attendance at least 90% of the time. So if they are remote learning, they have to attend school. And we'll talk more about that later, but they've got to attend school at least 90% of the time in order to earn credit for the year. Athletics and fine arts. This is data hot off the presses. Some changes were made this week by the state of Texas. Um, all of our students may participate in both before school and after school activity, whether you choose hybrid or face-to-face -face or remote learning as your option. Every child has the ability to access um, extracurricular activities that, are, that take place on campus. And again, that's before school or after school. No child will be denied that opportunity because of their learning choice next year. And then you can see some adjustments that were made to, to music and athletics already because of COVID-19. Marching band will officially begin on September 7th. And that is again, because of COVID. So the, that marching band season has been extended. More information will come from our marching band directors in ECISD and then athletics. You can see that in uh, the fall sports season, we, we offer these four sports. I'll point out football and, and because that, that involves a lot of folks. 
you can see that the first day for a game is September 24th. So that extends, that pushes out the start of our football season, as well as the volleyball season. The first day is the 14th. And then cross country and tennis, their first day would be on September 7th. Again, all of that is because of COVID-19, those seasons have been pushed. So those of you that are involved in athletics, your coaches can provide more information on what that's gonna look like for specific teams. Buses, next year we will operate uh, transportation, but we will not be putting 70 students on a bus. We will limit uh, one student per seat. Students are required to wear a mask at all times when they're on the bus next year. They'll be required to use hand sanitizer as they get on the bus. Our drivers and driver assistants will not only have masks, but they'll be wearing face shields as well. And our, our transportation will op also operate operate using multiple routes because we cannot put 70 kids on a bus. That means our drivers and buses have to um, do use multiple routes next year to pick up our students. So some of your students may arrive at school at eight, some may arrive at 8.30, some may arrive at nine o'clock, et cetera. And uh, so we are preparing for that staggered start to our morning and that staggered end to the day to ensure that all children are receiving uh, that high quality education, no matter when they arrive at school and no matter when they leave school during the day. So next steps, um, uh, we are, as you can see, July 29th, you as a parent um, must let us know uh, what you want for your child, which option do you prefer for your kid? And I know in order for you to do that, you need to have all of your questions answered. And I, I, I'm glad that you as parents are gonna uh, are, are investing your time and energy in fully understanding what this learning opportunity is for your child or your children. And we want you to make really wise choices. July 29th through August 2nd, during that window of time, every parent in ECISD must make ch choices uh, for your children. So it's a choice for each child. As a family, you may make different choices for different children in the same household. That is perfectly fine. Um, and again, we'll, uh, the slides indicate what those choices are. So hybrid uh, is available for uh, everybody, uh, pre or third grade really through 12th grade. Our virtual experience is available for everybody. So parents, if you wanna keep your kids home and have them in that environment, that is available for everybody. And then our elementary and middle school families, your additional choice is you may send your children to school every single day of the week if that's a choice that you wanna make. So those are the choices. Uh, ask lots of questions, make sure you find out the information that you need so you can make a wise choice. We've got to know, however, by August 2nd. August 3rd and 4th, a new teacher orientation for us. That's gonna be a virtual experience for our teachers this year, so something new. Uh, on August 5th, you'll hear a lot of commotion as our staff members return to work on August 5th. Uh, also on August 5th and through August 11th, we'll be delivering devices for kids, not delivering, but we'll offer uh, device pickup. So you as families can come by school and pick up those devices if you want them for your children. More information about that will be forthcoming. And finally, the first day of school for all 34,000 children will be on August 12th. And again, most kids on that day will start virtually, but we will have some kids that will start face-to-face. -face. All right, that's a lot of information. And I'm sure as this last slide says, you have lots of questions. So I'm going to stop sharing that. There we go. And going to go to our questions. And already there are a lot of questions. So we're going to try to work through these. I've got my experts on the screen and um, I'm going to pitch some of these questions to them. Um, and we'll start with Lilia. So first question about special ed. What, what will special ed look like next year in ECISD? Well, that's an excellent question. So um, uh, our special ed services will uh, happen. So if uh, what we're doing is we're encouraging all children that um, are enrolled in a specialized unit. We definitely want your children to come to school every day. So uh, that will be um, something that we encourage all our students that are served in a specialized unit to come. But many of our students uh, are supported through a mainstream or inclusion uh, services. And so the inclusion teacher uh, and the classroom teacher will work together to support students like they have traditionally in a face-to-face -face environment and or through the virtual experience um, through a scheduled meeting where the regular uh, teacher and the special ed teacher work together. And then of course the special ed teacher, they can co-teach, they can pull small groups or support the students individually that need that special service. 
That was interesting. Uh, even last night at our, our board meeting, Dr. Nanyas, we approved uh, a new opportunity. Uh, in fact, I think our, we have kids doing it this summer. So speech services. Uh, we've had kids in speech throughout the summer, and that's been a virtual experience. And I know that we'll continue that opportunity for our students as we enter the fall. And I believe I heard you say last night that that's been a pretty popular opportunity for kids that are engaged in speech um, as, as they experience that in a virtual environment. It's been pretty effective for those kids. So it that's certainly good. has. Mm -hmm. All right, hey, Dr. Uh, um, Howard, this one's for you. Is there going to be a meet the teacher night this year? Yes, there absolutely will be. It may not be an in-person meet the teacher night, uh, but we do plan on having a meet the teacher um, orientation types um, event where parents and students can meet their teacher and also learn what that first day of school is going to look like. Um, so whether that first day of school is August 12th in the building or at home remotely, um, that orientation and meet the teacher will provide a lot of information. So that will be coming. I'm going to do a follow-up with you, Dr. Howard. Um, we've had some questions about what is it going to look like next year, and I think that's the physical space, whether I'm moving to a new school or I just want to know what my own school is going to look like. Um, I, I think we're, we might be uncomfortable having people visit schools, but how can we share that information with our parents? So absolutely, you know, bringing in people to the building right now, we're trying to limit the number of people that come into our buildings, but we definitely understand that parents and, and students want to see their school. Maybe it's a brand new school for them or they want to see their new grade level wing or something like that. So we'll be providing videos. Um, we're actually doing some work tomorrow with our opening school team leaders to go through a day in the life of. So the, a day in the life of a student, a, an elementary student, middle school, high school, and, and teachers and bus drivers. And so as we work through those, we will be um, providing, you know, day in the life of videos so that, that families can see what it will look like, as well as help those, you know, younger students, especially that they may be entering pre-K or kindergarten. So this will be their first time in the building, you know, and, and traditionally kindergarten, you know, has gone to meet the teacher. They've dropped off all their supplies. Uh, they know where their desk is. And so we'll be doing all of that in a virtual setting. Our campuses did a really good job at the end of the year having virtual celebrations and award ceremonies. So that's something they've learned how to do. Yeah, that, those, will, those videos and images will be helpful. I, I like the day in the life of videos. You know, that will help not only our parents, but our kids see what you know, what this new school iteration is going to look like. And as a, you know, parents, we, we've all been, we've had 13 years of school experience. So we know what it looks like, but nobody knows what it's going to look like in this new environment. So that, that's a great idea. Uh, Dr. Nanya, is this one's coming to you. Uh, so I just saw that schedule and is on, on those remote learning days, does my kid have to sit in front of a computer for eight hours? <laughs> Uh, no. <laughs> so uh, the state of Texas has a minimum requirement of minutes for remote learning. And so for elementary students, that's 180 minutes, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're sitting in front of a computer talking to a teacher the entire time. Uh, those 180 minutes that are minimum um, will include instruction or videos provided by the teacher. Again, parents will not be the teachers for the students in this uh, remote uh, learning environment. The teachers will provide uh, uh, videos, um, access to all the assignments. So if I'm a pre-K-2 student, a parent or a child can log into Seesaw and all the videos, instructional assignments will be loaded up on Seesaw. If I'm a third through 12th grade student, I log into my Google Classroom and I will have access to all my instruction uh, assignments and instructional videos through those platforms. Now, the neat thing about um, the opportunity for meeting with your teachers virtually is that we heard our students loud and clear last spring they missed their teachers they missed the interaction and collaboration opportunities with their students so we will provide scheduled real-time virtual classes just like we're doing today which is called synchronous learning um, but in the case that a child or a student cannot log in at that particular uh, hour um, teachers will have instruction instructional videos loaded up into their Google Classroom or their Seesaw platform, and they'll be able to access the direct instruction through that format. 
Thank you, Dr. Nanez. And there's another question, and I'll kind of respond to this one and really tap off something you said. You, the question is, is remote learning, uh, is, does it occur during school hours? And the answer to that is, is yes. You know, you just mentioned the word synchronous. That means I'm live with a teacher. And the only way to be live with a teacher is during the school day. And so that synchronous learning experience that we really want for our kids will not only occur during the school day, it'll actually occur at the same time um, that learning should really following that child's schedule. So if math begins at 8.30 in the morning, that synchronous learning occur, or that, that um, yeah, that, that remote learning experience occurs at 8.30 in the morning, because that's when my teacher is live. So it certainly will occur. Some of the asynchronous learning, however, can that occur after hours? Absolutely. Um, you know, because we know that kids need breaks and, you know, you can pause a, a, a video during an asynchronous a time and, and work on, on uh, that video, listening to that instructional uh, resource uh, anytime during day or night. And so um, that's the great thing about having both asynchronous and synchronous options. So if a, if a student logs into the live session with the teacher and then they still have questions, the teacher will upload that video of instruction and the student can access that video of instruction and rewatch it. It's like a reteaching opportunity built right in. Good. No, thank you. Um, Dr. Howard, this one's coming to you. Will kids be counted absent if they have connectivity or technology issues during remote learning? And so that, again, kind of goes back to what Dr. Nanez was talking about with the asynchronous learning. So even if they're expected to log in at the same time with their teacher, if for some reason they do not have access during that time, their device isn't working, um, if they can log back into that asynchronous learning piece and be able to complete assignments, uh, submit assignments, engage with their teacher. And so it, the attendance piece really comes down to have they engaged in learning in that day. And so we'll actually be putting out an attendance and enrollment um, FAQ to answer questions for parents and students related to attendance and, and how to address that if a situation like that occurs. And of course, communication will be key uh, you know, with the teacher if something like that happens. Good. Dr. Howard, I'm gonna stay with you for this next one. Uh, what will classrooms look like? How many kids will be in classrooms? Because you know, I think for some parents, that's gonna influence their decision. Sure. So we've already talked about the fact that they'll get to actually see images, but you want to describe a little bit more? Sure, absolutely. So uh, first of all, one of the things that we've talked about is, you know, typically in elementary and in kindergarten in particular, we teach our students how to share in kindergarten. And now we're going to have classrooms set up in a way that we discourage sharing. You know, don't share crayons, don't share glue sticks. Um, you know, don't push your desks together and, and, and do that work. So the classrooms will look very differently. Um, we'll be using the guidance from TEA and, and we'll use appropriate distancing um, and, and make sure that our students have their, their individual spaces. Um, in addition to that, there will be cleaning that goes on throughout the, the, the day. And so when a teacher is out of the classroom, te uh, students are out of the classroom, there will be schedules where uh, disinfecting happens during the day. Uh, but, you know, if you walk into an elementary classroom, you know, before spring break, had you have walked in, you might see four desks pushed together. You might see a round table where students were sitting together. And it won't look like that as we start the year. Um, students will have their space. Um, they'll have their individual materials and supplies that they use. If they do have to share uh, manipulatives or tools, those will be disinfected after each use. We're not going to teach our kindergartners how to share. We're going to have to teach them how to share thoughts and ideas versus materials. Now that's, you know, we, we've had this discussion. I remember having this conversation with cabinet members and it was that realization, you know, that very precious um, opportunity to teach a child how to share and what that means. It, our, our, our teachers are going to be a bit more challenged this year as we uh, explore the concept of sharing in an environment in which sometimes that's going to be discouraged. Um, but with ideas, and certainly there are other ways to share. So uh, parents, we may have to elicit your uh, support in uh, helping our children learn that very important value um, of sharing. Coming back at you, uh, Dr. Nanez, if I'm a high school student and I'm participating in remote learning, can I be self-paced? Well, that's an interesting question. 
So the Texas Education Agency is requiring students to be engaged daily. And so part of those requirements, it um, requires students to submit assignments every day and show progress every day. So, you know, it's an interesting question with self-paced. Um, uh, we really um, are going to be working very carefully with our students. And as the requirements uh, are uh, for taking attendance, you know, students will have to engage in the learning process um, every day and submit assignments every day. So, you know, as far as the self-paced course, you know, there are some exceptions to that, but that um, those kinds of decisions um, usually are are made between the students and the counselors. But traditionally, if you're working in a remote environment, we are required to have students engage and show progress on a daily basis. Yep. I think, you know, this, this, we have an incredible opportunity in this environment to really explore uh, our students who want to be self-paced and who have that ability uh, to do that. And we have many kids pre-K through 12th grade who deserve that opportunity. And, and I, I think our opportunity as an organization as we travel to this new world is how do we make that self-paced um, opportunity that's available in asynchronous learning, how do we make that more real for our kids? And I think you heard Dr. Nanya say, it may mean we have, may have to push up a little bit on our the Texas Education Agency to make that more realistic for our kids. Um, I'm glad our kids are asking for that. I'm glad parents are asking for that. It's up to us uh, to work on their behalf to figure it out. So outstanding question. Um, so I've never asked that. That, that, that's great. And, our and commitment there, are, there are some options for students to work on a self-paced uh, platform, such as on our Imagine platform. No. You know, that's adaptive. Um, and so that can be a self-paced uh, uh, situation for them. So, Dr. Nanyas, when you were talking earlier, you mentioned a variety of different resources. How do I know as a parent which website to go to for what? I, I'm already confused. Well, um, we have agreed that our pre-K through second grade students will log into Seesaw. Um, that is an interactive platform where teachers and students can um, access um, resources, upload assignments, even schedule the synchronous or scheduled virtual meetings. And so parents don't have to guess whether it's Google Classroom or some other platform. If you are a pre-K through second grade student, Seesaw will be the platform where all the assignments and the schedules and the, the virtual meetings will happen. Third through 12th grade students, it'll be Google Classroom. And okay. so we will be uploading assignments through there. So more information on the ECISD website. We've talked a little bit about that. In fact, right now, parents, you can visit the ECISD website and actually see some information posted on our opening of school plans. And I do believe, and there's a whole big uh, frequently asked question document already there as we've been receiving questions already. I encourage parents to really visit that almost every day as we'll be adding new content. Um, so a good place for information. And, and, and your own school, you know, as we begin to roll out these plans, your child's teacher, uh, that will that, that will be the teacher of record. That individual will provide uh, guidance to your child as to those websites and, and appropriate uh, places to go as well. Uh, Dr. Howard, this one's for you. Um, is remote learning offered only during the phase in period or is that something for the entire school year? So Dr. Mary, right now, the guidance we have from TEA is that remote learning is an option for our families. Um, you know, and that is as, as of today, we never know when the agency might change that, but we have no indication that that option is going to be removed anytime in the near future. So um, students and parents and families who select remote learning, they'll have the opportunity to continue that as long as, as they choose to do it and as long as the Texas Education Agency allows us to do it. And again, we do not anticipate that being removed as an option. Uh, with that being said, um, on July 29th through August 2nd, families will choose in person or remote. They will have options to change between those at certain times of the year. And so um, with that, that initial opportunity to change would be at the end of that first uh, phase in period. So uh, we'll be putting out some timelines and guidelines um, asking for a, at least a two week notice to move between in person or remote or remote to in person. Uh, just to allow our, our campuses time to adjust and get schedules ready. 
And uh, but that first opportunity to change between in person and remote or remote to in person would be the end of the um, phase in, which is August 28th. And then after that, it's the grading period. So six week grading periods that are two. Uh, traditional comprehensive high schools and nine week grading periods at our other campuses. So we've planned for remote learning to last for the entire year, but again, that's TEA right now is allowing that. So potentially they could take that away, but right now we have no indication that they'll do that. So the ECISD plan is to offer that uh, opportunity for kids all year. And then the, the, the opportunity to change, I think is important too for parents to know and understand. Once you make your, your selection, you are not locked into that selection for your children for the entire school year. At the end of each grading cycle, a parent may opt for a different choice if they so choose. And so that, that's important for our parents to know as well. So good. Um, hey, Dr. Howard, we've talked about this one. We, we recognize that as we bring people back to the building, adults and children, that a case of COVID-19 could happen in any one of our buildings. What happens when a student or a staff member um, is uh, po test positive for the virus? Yeah, so we have protocol related to that. And um, the first thing that we have to do is determine who has been in close contact with that employee or, or even a student. And so close contact is determined in a couple of ways. One is that they were within six feet of each other for at least 15 minutes or longer while not wearing a mask. And that's why it's so critical that our employees and students wear their mask. Uh, the other way that, that close contact is defined is if um, there's that direct exposure without a mask. And so um, the person that was diagnosed with COVID-19 coughs directly on you, you're not wearing a mask. And so with that being said, then we narrow down where is that close contact and who came into close contact. And those, um, those members would be quarantined. Uh, we have uh, cleaning teams that would then go in and deep clean those areas where that person had been. And um, the agency, Texas Education Agency, allows us up to five days to do that. Of course, our plan would be to do it overnight if we could and have that learning space available again, even if it were for a different group of students. Okay, good, good. And I, more information about that whole process will be available on the ECISD website, correct? Yes, that's correct. And there are quite a few protocols. We're going to be following all the CDC guidance, the uh, TEA guidance, as well as guidance from our own local um, government officials. And, and so it is pretty stringent what must happen should a student or a staff member uh, test positive for the virus. A couple questions, I'll respond to these uh, quickly. A question about OC Tech. Will OC Tech be following the same rules uh, and pathways that uh, ECISD sets? Um, we're, we work pretty closely with the Odessa College campus and and their administration and uh, we will collaborate on all of the decisions and we'll make those decisions jointly right now um, students on their campuses are expected certainly to follow all ecisd rules um, but but again some of that is is dependent upon the rules that that odessa college puts in place and we work very closely with odessa college and their administration and um, and uh, more information um, about any adjustments that need to be made um, will will certainly be forthcoming but but the plan right now is that that students ecisd students on the oc campus would follow all of those rules another quick question um, about our nt from our nto uh, campus um will nto students will be bused really from ohs to permian so odessa to permian uh, and that happens right now we have no plans to change that busing protocol uh, and that's as of today july 22nd of 2020 um, we want to make sure that all of our kids have uh, the very best academic experiences that they can. And we know that the movement that happens uh, between our schools for a variety of reasons, uh, career and technology education, we have a lot of CTE kids that travel to different places uh, for different experiences. And we want all of those uh, to continue. Uh, but more information about that is forthcoming. Lilia or, um, or Dr. Nanez or Dr. Howard, any responses to that one? Uh, the one thing I would say on that previous question, uh, Mr. Miller, the principal at OC Tex, would be a great resource. He'll he knows our protocols. He's very you know he knows the OC protocols and could explain any overlap there. But again, we're following very similar protocols um, on the busing. Again, those safety processes will be in place. So students will use the hand sanitizer when they get on the bus. They'll wear their mask. And um, but we we want 
learning to continue. And that's something that was one of the parameters that our that our team has used as we've developed these plans. Uh, we understand that our students, that learning has to go on. Um, the commissioners talked about a health crisis cannot become an education crisis. And so we have to continue educating our students and do that in a safe way. Yeah, no, absolutely. Agreed. So I, I, really, that's a good kind of good guidance going back to the school administration. Um, many times the, the best person to get an answer to some of your questions is the administration of your school, because some of these are school specific questions. That, that's that's a great point. And, and our principals are also learning. Again, this information changes on a regular basis. So we try to keep our principals as up to date with the latest information um, as we possibly can. Um, with buses being full, so at ECISD, many times our buses uh, contain, you know, they're full, 70 kids on a bus. So Dr. Howard, um, what will what will a bus look like if it normally has 70 kids? Right. Well, first of all, uh, we will not be transporting the number of students that we have in the past because 35 percent of our families have selected remote learning. And then in addition to that, with the A-B schedule, that's going to reduce that 30, that 65 percent number down, you know, maybe even in half. Uh, but our students, when they enter the bus, they'll use the hand sanitizer. They'll be wearing their mask. One student per seat. Um, if a, a student or two, two students are from the same family, they may sit in the same seat. But otherwise, students will, will sit in their own individual seats. Uh, what that's meaning for our transportation team is they'll be running multiple routes throughout the day, delivering students to school and, and bringing them home. Uh, those buses will be disinfected after every drop off. And so our bus drivers will be cleaning in between routes and in between picking up new students. Dr. Nanyas, this one's for you. In the phase in process, we define a group of students that are coming back in that first in phase one as um, students receiving special services. Who, who are those kids? What, who falls into that category? Um, well, we prioritize uh, our special services kids as students that are in a specialized unit, maybe our autistic students, our medically fragile students. Um, special services also include bilingual ESL. Um, so right. anyone in those in those groups uh, are considered special. So special education students, maybe my child is dyslexic, maybe my child is an English learner, et cetera. Those are the special mm -hmm. services kids. Okay, all right. So again, parents, if you're uncertain, if your child falls into one of those categories, you can either reach out to the district or specifically your own principal uh, would be able to, to, to assure you as to if your child is in any of the categories, if, if that is confusion. A couple of questions about technology. So we're happy to answer these. Um, if a student lives in the county, so maybe you live a, a distance from the downtown area, will we be providing not only a device, but Wi-Fi? Uh, the answer to that is, is yes, we are right now working. In fact, we've received quite a bit of grant money. So any family that does not have broadband access in their home, um, again, you don't have that access today, you'll be seeing information on the website shortly and we'll be uh, giving information out uh, to make sure families that don't have that access, that they will have that information. We know who many of those families are. Um, we'll be communicating with you directly, but you'll have an opportunity to receive a free broadband uh, through June 30th of next year. So June 30th of 2021. So more information coming about that. In addition, we have families that do not live in areas that are served by broadband. Some of the areas in the west and south portion of our school district don't have broadband service. And we will be providing other types of devices, but the reality is some of our families live in places that, that it doesn't matter what we provide, uh, they simply don't have access because the service hasn't been uh, generated there yet or hasn't been brought to that part of our community. We as an organization have launched a, an, an enormous project uh, to bring broadband access to every family in ECISD. You'll be hearing more about that big body of work. It is a multi-million dollar project um, it will involve our city and county, um, our state and federal governments as well. It's a, a big body of work. So more information forthcoming, um, but broadband to each of our homes is a, again, a big body of work for us. So we're excited about that and more information about that is coming. Um, let's see, I have a, Lilia or Dr. Nani assistance probably for you. I have a high schooler in band. If, if that child chooses remote learning, can they still be in the band? Of course, you bet. Anything, you know, any of our extracurricular activities that um, students sign up for, if they choose the remote option, they are still eligible to participate in band, dance, athletics, etc. 
Another question for you, Dr. Nanya, is so, I'm, and this is at the elementary level. So if I'm an elementary parent and I choose face-to-face -face for my child, will they, will they experience virtual learning uh, in that school environment? Um, yes, the, the short answer to that is yes, because uh, say I'm a third grade student um, and I have an A-B schedule, uh, in order to keep the students safely uh, distanced, um, the face-to-face -face day, they will have that direct instruction in the, in the classroom. But um, if I'm a five-day student uh, that's attending school, I could be, for my remote day, be placed in another area where I can be socially distanced and I'll be monitored uh, by an adult and I will be able to engage in the remote learning through my device that is provided by the school. That's correct. So safety is the driver. We've got to make sure that our kids are safe. And so, yes, um, at the elementary level and even at the middle school level, if a, if a child is going to be there five days a week, that doesn't necessarily mean they'll be face to face in a classroom every day. They could be in another part of the building experiencing learning in a virtual environment. Yes. And that right now is driven by the medical situation in our community. That is a COVID-19 decision. We've got to keep our staff members safe and we've got to keep our, our students safe in that environment. Um, Dr. Howard, this one's coming to you. Let me let me offer a little bit of, of a couple of answers and then I'm going to turn it to you. Um, but the question is, at what point would the district go strictly to remote learning because of outbreaks in our community? I will tell you that there are two data elements that we're monitoring as a school district. The first is Posit the positivity rate, and that is the percentage of individuals that are testing positive for COVID-19. When that rate is, is fairly high, above 10%, uh, that's not healthy. That means the spread of COVID-19 is significant in our community. The second um, element that we look at is the amount of cases that are occurring over a two-week period of time. If we see a decline in cases over a two-week period of time, that's a good sign, and we want to see that in our community. The last several weeks, we've seen a steady increase in cases every single day. Until the last few days, we've seen a little bit of a topping off of that. And so we will monitor those two um, data elements to help inform the decision that we make as an organization. But Dr. Howard, if indeed the condition worsens, and we're, maybe it's October, and we have to make the switch. What will that look like in ECISD? How do we do that? Right, so our teams have planned for all three scenarios. And one of the things we asked them to do and challenged the scheduling teams to do is to build schedules that will allow us to transition in between in-person, um, hybrid and remote. And so, uh, you know, we could, we could shift on a Friday and let, let families know that on Monday, we're gonna to have to move to remote learning. Of course, we'll give as much notice as we possibly can, but in some cases, um, you know, that could be a, a quick decision. But because our students will have devices, um, our teachers will be trained and, and able to shift to remote learning. Uh, that, that learning in school would continue, it would just have to be in a remote setting. Absolutely, good. And we'll give parents notice of that. I think it's important, and you've commented on this earlier, that could literally happen in a day's notice. We're all, we're in school on Monday, we find out something Monday night, and the next day we're all remote. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, our teachers are gonna be working in that environment, so they'll have some expertise on how to shift on a dime, but mm -hmm. one reason that we want children to bring their laptops back and forth to school is for that very reason. We never know when that may occur, um, hopefully not. So a couple more questions and then we'll kind of wrap it up. Um, and I'm not sure which one of you wants this one. It's about the supply list. Lots of people wanna know about supplies, specifically, where can we find them? When will they be posted? And in a virtual environment, is the supply list different than it is in a face-to-face -face environment? So who wants that? Either one of us can answer that. Okay, well, I'll, I'll take it. So the supply list is posted on the website and we do encourage parents to um, provide those supplies for students because um, the lesson plans, and again, the instruction is going to require students to have uh, the tools necessary to be successful with their learning. So we do uh, encourage you to uh, look at that supply list and um, provide the students with those necessary tools. Right. And I'll add to that, um, even the students that are going to learn remote every day, uh, teachers will still be talking to them and helping them get their binders set up and get organized and, and refer back to their materials and, and their binder. And so 
whether they're going to be in the building or not, the teachers will be, you know, utilizing that and then helping students be organized. Um, we have added to the um, school supply list the face coverings. So for again, for grades four through 12, that is required. We will provide those if that is an issue um, or if, if a student forgets it at home that day. But we do ask that parents um, provide those if they choose to and are able. And then for pre-K two students or pre-K three, I'm sorry, um, that is a recommended, but again, required for transition. So uh, we ask that you add the, the face covering to your school supply list. So may I wear my Miami Dolphins face covering? <laughs> well, we prefer other teams, but oh, you can wear that. <laughs> so it might be dangerous to wear that. I'll, I'll try to keep that one to myself. Then. You're in All Texas, right. sir. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. A couple more real fast. Um, uh, Stephanie, this one's for you. Um, how will parents um, inform us as to their decision? Yes, yeah, so the survey that we'll put out on July 29th, that survey will be online. Um, our campuses will be helping get the word out. Um, you'll receive um, phone messages, all kinds of messages. It'll be all over social media. And so on July the 29th, we ask that all of our families watch for that survey. You'll have until August 2nd to complete the survey. It'll be very short. The one that you took a couple of weeks ago, uh, it will be even shorter than that. So you'll literally be selecting in person or remote and you'll acknowledge that that choice and selection. Good. A couple more questions. I kind of nab these um, drop off and pick up procedures. You'll hear that directly from the school level. So that information is forthcoming. It is going to be different this year. And so parents be ready for some change with drop off and pick up. But that information is forthcoming at the school level. Um, can children this year use their own laptops and tablets? Answers: yes. Not everybody may want to use the device that we provide. That's perfectly fine. Students may bring their own tools. You're welcome to do that. And the last one is about registration. And uh, ladies, I'll let you weigh in on this one, but I want to say it is critically important uh, that, that all of our parents, pre-K through 12th grade, um, enroll and register your kids. That information is available today on the ECISD website. So I encourage all of you to do that. I know that we are starting a registration roadshow. I believe that's next week. Dr. Howard or Dr. Nanya, does either one of you have details on that? Um, yes, that is actually starting next week. They'll be at different locations every day. Uh, that information is on our website. There's actually a registration and enrollment tab right in the middle of the website. So if you log on, uh, there's information about pre-K registration and then there's the uh, registration and enrollment and that has all of the information. Uh, if you have any trouble finding that, let us know and, and we'll be glad to assist. Uh, the campuses also have that registration roadshow information. And all you have to do is look for the big yellow bus at those locations that's because right. that's how we'll be doing it. But I'd also like to remind our parents that if we, if they have a students or children that are going to be doing remote learning for the in five days a week, they also have to register. They have to be students, registered students of ECISD in order to access all our instructional resources and our teachers. Yeah. Last question, ladies, and I want both of you to answer this uh, individually. And I want you to take off your uh, school administrator hat and put on your mom hat and talk to our moms and dads. Um, I'll go first. I have two students that are enrolled in the district. One will be a fifth grader. One will be an 11th grader. Um, both had very different learning experiences after spring break. Um, my daughter that will be a junior you know, she did fine, very organized, very responsible. My fourth grader at the time, I would come home at the end of the day, which might be seven or eight o'clock because we were working so many hours. And I would ask her, you know, did you get everything done? Oh, yes, mom, I got everything done. And then I would get messages from the teacher indicating that that wasn't the case. And so um, very different children. And, and so uh, parents out there, we know that that you your kids are different and some may be excelled with remote learning and you may want to choose that option. Uh, some did not and it wasn't because they couldn't do the work. They just weren't as, as disciplined to do the work, um, especially if you had to work like I did. My husband and I both work and worked every day of that time. And so, um, you know, and making decisions about going back to school, uh, both of the girls will go back in person, of course, uh, you know, on, on that rotation for the high school student. Uh, but but I think that social interaction, I know just just with my kids, just 
having been you know locked up in the the house for so long um even though they've gotten out and and, and you know smartly engaged in different activities they're ready to be back in school back with their teachers their coaches their friends and so um that that's my story as a parent well, and, and uh, as, a, as a mother too, I have two sons, but uh, one thing that I would think about as a parent is that I would want to make sure that my children know how to put their masks on and how to wear them and to leave them alone. You know, that takes training. Um, I went to grab a sandwich at lunch today at Subway. And while I was waiting for my, my sandwich, I saw a mom with two very young children. They were probably maybe uh, six and eight, and the children were so cute, grabbing their masks, putting them on, and going through the line with their face face mask. And I think as a mom, I would want to practice that skill that could be a lifesaver um, with my young children and with the older ones as well. Good deal. All right, ladies, uh, thank you for joining me tonight. And, and I guess my last words uh, for you as parents, moms and dads, and those of you that are, are guardians of, of your most precious resource, uh, we, we know that the 34,000 kids that we serve in our system represent your most valuable possession, your most valuable commodity, uh, your children. And I can assure you as the superintendent and the team that we work with here, this entire organization, we will do our very best to ensure that your children are safe, as safe as we can possibly make them. Uh, we will ensure that they receive a high quality, rigorous educational experience. This is new territory for us as well. Uh, like I share with my team all the time, we are taking this journey together. Your feedback to us is important. We want to answer um, all of your questions and we want you to feel comfortable and confident in the choice that you make. And whether it is face-to-face, -face, hybrid, or completely virtual, we respect that decision and we will do our very best as your school system um, to keep your kids again safe uh, and to make sure that the education they receive will help them be successful uh, in life. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Dr. Nanez. Uh, thank you, Dr. Howard, uh, for your words of wisdom tonight. And thank you, moms, um, as well as Dr. Howard and uh, Dr. Uh, Nanez for, uh, for re really representing both hats tonight. Um, and we look forward to, uh, again, listening to our parents and we'll be on live next Thursday night at seven o'clock. We hope you join us at that time. Thank you and have a good night.